Entertaining, informative, and educational. Inspiring content that makes a difference. This is the Maximus Choi Publications Broadcasting Network. Join the Academy. show is brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where we will help you to increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and help you to improve the quality and performance of your fowl. As a member, I'll provide you a roadmap that you will need to create a true family restraint. Starting with a cock from one breeder and a hen from another breeder, no problem. We can help you to turn your flock of hybrid crosses or mongrels into a pure family restraint and show you how to continually improve that strain each generation. We'll start by showing you how to select your seed fowl and how to turn that seed fowl into a high quality foundation strain. Our proven breeding programs and specialty courses are designed to take you step by step through the breeding process. And best of all, I'll be there to help you every step of the way. We urge you to check it out. You have nothing to lose and you can cancel at any time. You also have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Simply go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. The Breeders Academy will not only change the way you think about breeding, but improve the way you breed your fowl. What a filthy job. Could be worse. How? Could be raining. Okay, welcome to another episode of Brett's Perfection. I'm Kenny Troiano, founder of the Breeders Academy, and I'm here with my wife, Nancy, and my co-host, Frank Bradley. What's going on, guys? Everywhere I go, I hear rain. <laughs> you can't, I can't even get away. away from here, can you? I want to send it all out to Nancy. Nancy loves rain so well. She likes rain. I, 
I just wanted her to have all of it. Oh, you want to hear something funny? And, and everybody knows that. Nancy loves weather. She thinks she's the weather lady, right? <laughs> sitting, when you guys were going through all those storms, she was sitting on this computer over here going through all these YouTube channels. They were talking, I mean, they're talking about weather and breaking it down, what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And she's checking all this out and she looks over to me and she goes, I am so glad I live in California. <laughs> I almost fell off my chair. Wow. <laughs> That's scary awesome. stuff. That was some scary stuff. I mean, I got to hand it to all you people on the East Coast, in the Midwest. Yeah, maybe even Washington and uh, Oregon, because they get a lot of weather up there. We are in a little pocket down here in San Diego, and we don't get diddly squat. I mean, we got some rain today, and we've been getting some rain throughout the winter months. You know, usually we get two or three rain storms a year. And we've been getting a lot this year, so I've been really, really loving it. Yeah, Fred goes me go. He said something about uh, needing to build his ark again, and I told him I go. I'm gonna have to pull out that banner again um, of you uh, setting up your ark and uh, getting ready for the winter. Uh, we're in spring, and I swear I can't. It just feels like winter. We're we're dealing with it here. It's wet. It's muddy. It's cold. Not for, not not to your standards, but I mean it's pretty bad here right now. Well, we had some eighty degree days. And then here to go from that, just beautiful weeks and you're enjoying it. And then you wake up the next day and it's like 37 degrees out. So it's, and it, that's hard on chickens. I mean, you know, uh, they're pretty good about climatizing to the weather. Even but, Kentucky chickens. Yeah. Even Kentucky chickens. <laughs> I mean, you go up and they're all happy, you know, they're vigorous, they're crowing. Uh, they're just happy to be alive. And then you go up after that temperature change and they're like, you know, just humped up, just, just totally different chickens after that, you know, but a couple of days after the cold, uh, even if it stays in the thirties, a couple of days after that, they go right back again. They adjust to it. They go on and, and they're good shape. It's just, they have a hard time like us dealing with the big change that way. Yeah. Tip, tip of the day. Do not do your selection when it's cold or when the weather changes. <laughs> no. no. like the worst time to do it. I'm telling you, but you know, I was laying in bed and uh, I was just waking up, and all of a sudden, I heard this roar. And it, Frank, it sounded like um, a tornado or a hurricane even going by. It was so loud, right? So I get up. I look out the window, and I don't see any rain. I look a little closer, and the hell was coming down so thick. And then I came into my den. I looked at my shed over here. We have like a mini garage over here. The whole roof was just completely white. I couldn't see the roof at all. It was so thick of hell. When was this? This morning. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. That, that's uh, we, we've honestly got them here so big. There were anywhere I've seen them the size of uh, golf balls up to oh tennis balls. Gosh. And my black truck was sitting in one of those, and I got numerous dents all in it. We didn't have a carport ready at that time. Uh, I, I've had to actually take my vehicles to a bank of deserted bank abandoned bank down the street and park under their drive through uh for that so if we catch it ahead of time we have to to protect our you know our bikes what we can't get under roof we, we take down there and put under there Jeez. Yeah. you know um i have quite a few outlines ready to go i mean we keep we keep cha the last couple of weeks we've been changing our mind changing our mind on what kind of show we've been wanting to do and i have some really good outlines but with everything going on in the east coast what frank's been telling me what nancy's been watching on uh, youtube and then us who, here too i mean like i said it's april feels like winter and uh, i thought it'd be a good time to talk about what to do and bad weather and preparing for the storm so i kind of put together an outline this will be a good one for today and then we'll get back on track it just i wanted to be more with the times what's what's happening today what's going on maybe people can relate to it because honestly the way it was looking and frank was telling me that he was expecting i think you said flash floods until tuesday or something like that i didn't even really think you were, i didn't wasn't even sure you were going to make this show tell you the truth yeah. i was like okay well even if we don't you know if the we're still having the rains and what have you then who who knows who's going to show up even watch this show? <laughs> okay, so I thought let's just do an easy one. Let's do one on storm. So th that's what we're going to do today. But I do want to welcome all the new members. Make sure to start with the uh, 
Well, begin with the Start Here pages. Uh, there's a lot of information on the website. Like we always say, don't try to absorb it all at one time. If you need any help, make sure to contact Frank and myself. And uh, there's a lot of programs in the works. We're putting pretty much information on there weekly. Uh, make sure you go at your own pace. We do have, if you go to the Start Here pages, you're going to see the beginner's track, the intermediate track, and we have a couple advanced tracks too. And then once you go through those, you can use the website as a reference. Uh, and that'll lead you through the Founders Program and a whole bunch of other things too. Uh, for the members, make sure you join us on the back end for the Breeders uh, Roundtable. Today's topic is going to be environmental environmental effects on the genome so and and i like that one because it kind of goes with what we're talking about today it kind of goes with the weather how the weather is going to affect your breeding how it's going to affect the way they inherit their traits how they pass their traits so i thought that'd be a good one to to take care of on the back end and then uh if you haven't joined the breeders academy make sure you do we have the master's class video series the Members Roundtable, the Founders Program, programs and courses that support the Founders Program, our daily articles. And like I said, we're adding new content pretty much every week. More master's class videos are coming, programs, courses, and the daily articles. And we also do coaching calls. So make sure you join the Breeders Academy. Just go to www.breedersacademy.com. Also, make sure you join our newsletter, which we call the Breeders Bulletin. There you're going to get a lot of free tips, a lot of free articles that I think you're going to enjoy. Just like I said, go to www.breedersacademy.com. Okay, so I, I, before we get into things, I just want to talk about a couple things before we get started. Um, some of you might have noticed if you check out my YouTube channel, I've cleaned it up a lot. We have a, I used to have the podcast on there. I only keep a few on there now, the most recent ones. If you want to watch the pod, uh, listen to the podcast, go to, let me put this up here. So you have reference, go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, the podcast, all the episodes for the podcast are there. You can check that over there. Uh, they're not going to be on YouTube like they were. Like I said, it's only going to be a few at a time. Also, we're only going to have a certain amount of YouTube videos or our live show on YouTube at one time. Everything else is going to be archived on the Breeders Academy. So for you members, if you want to watch some of the old uh, live show, make sure to go on to uh, the Breeders Academy for that, and you'll find those pretty easily. The other, uh, about a week or so ago, um, I was on YouTube. And YouTube sent me a notice saying, hey, why don't you do YouTube memberships? And I didn't really want to do that because I wanted everything to be on the website itself. But uh, Nancy and I talked it over, and I think I talked it over with Frank, too, and thought it was a good idea that we can make, them a, we can make all the live shows, a complete archive, available to, I want to call you the general public, people that aren't members. Okay, and so if you go on my YouTube channel, right next to the subscribe button, there's a join button. And it's, uh, it's like 25 bucks a month, and you get access to all the live shows, all the past live shows, and we'll be adding to that weekly. Now, for my members of the Breeders Academy, do not join that. Everything is on the website already for you, okay? And it's just the archive of live shows. So these, these people here that are joining the YouTube channel membership, they're not getting the master's class videos. They're not getting the mount members round table. They're not getting the members Q and a, they're not getting any of those kind of videos. It's just the, the archive of live shows. And so that's the way we're going to make that available to you guys. Um, uh, but you'll, you'll, you'll continue to get the live show as we do them on there, but I'm only going to keep like 10 or 12 on there, Frank, you know? Yeah. Well, the thing about it is, uh, you put everything on there, um, uh, for free. It's really not fair to the members. If you think about it, I mean, the members, you know, they pay to, to play, so to speak. And, uh, that that's part of theirs. Now, 
like you said, there's not going to be any masterclass videos or anything like that on it. Just, you know, basically the live show and the podcast, but still that's truly really not fair to the members for people to be getting it for free. And that's part of what they get as a member. So I, I can really see that aspect of it. it. It's fair to them. It really yeah, is. I think it's going to work out good. What do you think, Nancy? Well, here's the thing. I watch a show on YouTube and I found it and then I binged watched, watched the show and I've watched all two years of their episodes. It's not that many, but I binge watched it. And I can think of the same way for um, the Bread to Perfection Live is people will find one episode and they'll like it and they'll start binge watching it. But you're only going to get to 10 to 12 episodes and you're done. And there we did like, what, 130 episodes in there? Uh, yeah. Well, this is 131. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a really good deal for them to be able to get every single one of those live shows that we've done. And there have been some hidden nuggets in those live shows that we've done that only the members know that, oh, yeah, I know that's a hidden nugget. But uh, it'll be nice for you guys to be able to go and watch every single one of them at your leisure. It's not like you have to go in and watch them all in one month. So, I don't know. I think it's a good deal. The only too. ones, yeah, the only ones that are not going to be on there are um, the uh, healthcare and disease prevention videos we did with Dr. Gallardo. Those are all on the website. Okay, so those won't be on there. There's a handful. I, I, I don't want to say all of the whole complete. I, and I, I know I said it. Maybe I shouldn't have said it. The whole comp It's not going to be the whole complete uh, collection of live shows, but it's a majority of it. Okay, the healthcare ones aren't on there. Let's see. There's a few here and there, and then some of them were what the ones we did for the uh, the website tour and things like that. So the the, the only one they're going to see is the most recent one, which is that that's the one that matters. So, but the majority of them are there. And, you know, I was looking, I was looking them over as I was putting them on there. Frank, those are all really good information. Yeah. If you listen, well, it, it, here's the thing about it. And in the old days, if you listen to something one time, you ask, okay, yeah, that was okay. It was all right. You listen to it again a week later and you're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't notice that last time. I didn't pick that up last time. Yeah, that's good information. And then it seemed like this is the way it is with me. I'm talking from my point of view. And then you listen to it, you know, two or three times, you just keep getting more out of it, more out of it as you listen to it. So uh, if you're set up in a way, just like Nancy was talking about, where you can actually binge, watch them at any time that you want, they're more valuable to you than just watching it one time and never hearing it again. Much, much more beneficial to listen to it more than once. You know, I was thinking about the other day because uh, Nancy was saying, why don't you cover this? And I go, well, we kind of did cover that. Well, why don't you cover this? Well, we kind of did cover that. We have topics, but we do a lot of cross. What, what do you want to say? How do you say it? Like where you're, you're covering multiple things in one subject, you know? Um, so it's like, well, we're going to cover some things here, but some of these things you've heard us talk about, talk about before. And I'm just really good about giving, you know, we do an hour's show, but we pack it full of information. And so some of it's going to be new. Some of it's going to be similar to what we've done before, that kind of thing. But I like that because I'm a big repetitious kind of guy. I learn that way. I teach that way and I promote it that way, you know, so well, here's the thing about it too, Kenny. It may be repetitious, but sometimes you will explain it in a different way and it will make more sense or it'll become more clear than you your original statement on that subject matter. Yeah. yeah so well, go ahead. There, there, there's different scenarios in that. I know yeah. when, when I'm listening to something like that, usually I'm in bed or at work and something can pull my attention away at that time that that particular part's coming up. And my mind doesn't pick it up. So when I go back, I'm like, how in the heck did I miss that? You know, it was obvious, but how did I miss it? But so it's little things that way. And going back again to what Nancy was saying, that gives you an opportunity of the stuff that you did miss that way, that you can go back and listen to it different times and actually pick, get the full benefit of the information. And I hear that a lot from the members about the members round table and the master's class video that they they really like listening to them over and over again, just for like what Frank was saying, that there's things 
that they miss every time they watch it. They go and watch it. They go and repeat it or watch it again, and they learn something new that they didn't hear before. And and it's, it's just a, a tribute to the kind of information that we provide. We're packed with – our outlines are packed with information. And then we um, improvise throughout the outline. You know, there's a lot of what, what we talk about that's not even on the outline, you know. And uh, that's with the live shows, that's with the master class videos, that's with the members roundtable. So that, I like that, you know, and, and, and it kind of goes back to what we're talking about here. A lot of the videos are going to be archived. So if you only watched them once, you missed a lot. <laughs> that's all I can say. You know what I mean? I had a, I had a buddy the other day, uh, watches the show and he got a hold of me and was asking me some questions uh, different on different topics. And he was a member for a while, and he goes, you know, before I'd watch the live shows, and you guys would get me pumped up, you know, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm understanding this. And he go, then you guys would go down that damn rabbit hole, and then you just leave me hanging, you know. And I said, well, did you become a member? Yeah. I said, well, it worked, <laughs> you know. So, uh, yeah, he, he, uh, he would always say, I tried to piece them together to where I could use them, and then I finally just give up. And decided just to become a member. So, um, and then, then he seen what we was talking about basically once he got in there as a member, the way we was wording it and the way we was giving the information of it out. I think you guys would be surprised that if you were to join and see how much information's in the website, um, I think we downplay it more than you think because, um, I mean, we highlight a few of the things like the master's class videos and members round table. I know we'd say that a lot of the programs and courses support the founders program, which we also have the founders program, but it's a lot of information, you know, and it, I don't know if it wasn't for the inflation and what's going on in the world. Honestly, my, my personal opinion is 50 bucks is not very much money, you know, for what we, what we provide. It should be more than that. You know, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to gain a lot more from that money uh they go buy one trio and get ripped off you know uh the breeders came if they if we can stop that from happening they've saved money in the end so i i see it as a great investment and i know i say this all the time in kenny do uh but it's no more than a couple bags of feed i mean uh you go buy this game cop mix right now and you're looking at 25 30 bucks a bag the way grains and stuff went up on it so I, and i mean a lot of times uh the uh, Breeders Academy, to me, is more important than the nutrition is in the beginning. So uh, it's well worth its money. Um, okay, I'm reacting to your guys' comment in the chat room. But going back to that, that rabbit hole deal, yeah, I explained to him that, you know, if we was giving out the information that was inside the Breeders Academy, one, it wouldn't be fair to the members. And two, what would be the use from, from them becoming members to get there? We couldn't, we couldn't cover all that in one of our shows. You know, you know how long it would take us, Kenny, to cover everything that's inside the academy in a one hour show? No. And, you know, yeah, you've got me and Kenny to tell you and basically sit here and talk about it for conversation. But with the, all the information it's got in combination, there's nothing else like it. I mean, anything you want to know on breeding and a whole breeding program with a scientific fact in the ending, I mean, it, it, it's worth its weight in gold. Well, I can tell you what I'm leaning towards, and that is to have maybe a half a dozen of the live shows on there at a time, half a dozen of the podcasts on there at a time, and then everything else be about the membership model. And I've had people say to me, Oh man, not the membership model again. Um, all I can tell you is get used to it because everybody is going that direction. It's everywhere you look. It's not just, I mean, yeah, you know, YouTube channels, shows, um, your cable TV, um, your electricity, your uh, streaming for like Netflix, whatever. All those are actually membership type models. So it's everywhere you look. And um, if if I was just here, if I was just on here just to have fun, Frank and I chatting and all that, 
and uh, which I am enjoying it. That would be one thing. But for people like us who actually make a living doing this, this is all we do. This is what this is. I don't have another job. This is it. I do this 24 hours a day and it feels like 24 hours a day. You know, I, I, get, I get out of bed. I go right to my desk and start working. OK, <laughs> and I don't stop other than to go feed my chickens exercise and get something to eat and i'm on there till two sometimes two o'clock in the morning <laughs> i go back to bed then i go to back back to bed and then i get up and do the same thing again we take one day off usually nancy's day off whatever nancy's day is off is the day we take off but this is what we do for a living and if it wasn't for that it's like we talked about it before frank it's the the gamecock magazine that i used to write for and i used to write for the poultry press the feathered warrior the grit still and some other uh, magazines all over the world at that time, I wasn't making money. I was doing it for the fun of it, for helping people. And I did that for almost 20 years. Okay. And it's not that I felt like, oh, it's time to start making money. It's just that when you when your hobby becomes your work and it takes up that much time, then the the way you teach changes. And so I went from just putting out information in the per periodicals to actually helping people on the phone all the time to, you know, building the website, to starting the podcast. The podcast became the magazines for me. But I just, what I did, I turned my hobby into my work, and now we're making a living at it, which is awesome. I love it. And it's because of you guys who are following us, joining us, becoming members, that are, you know, you guys are allowing me to do this, and I, and I am so grateful for it. I'm real happy about that. So... Well, you go back, you mentioned the Gamecock magazine, though, Kenny. Uh, think about how many people uh, had a subscription to the Gamecock magazine, okay, for many, many years. I know I had probably for 35 years, if not longer. And this is no different. And it's a, it's pretty much the same price of what they was charging, a yearly fee is what Kenny's charging for this. And to say that uh, the Gamecock magazine wasn't educational, it was. Uh, there were some really good articles in it. Kenny mentioned the, yeah, he wrote in it. A lot of people wrote some good articles that was in there, but the Breeders' Cabinet is nothing like the Gamecock. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you just have to see it to believe it. I, I couldn't put it into words to explain it, but if, if you're serious about breeding, the Breeders' Cabinet is where you need to be because it's the start and the beginning. It doesn't have different articles saying different things like Gamecock. You'd have, one guy say this about breeding, like Kenny's article. Then you'd have another guy write something that was totally against to what Kenny was saying. So you never know which you know which side of the fence to get on. With this right here, it's straightforward. It's scientific. Uh, it's a whole breeding program. It doesn't leave you uh, on the edge of a cliff, scratching your head, wondering which way you're going to go, where if you're going to have to grow wings to be able to go. But, uh, I mean, it, there's no similarity. That... That's the biggest part of the Breeders' Cabinet. It's it's a, how should I say, it's a world oil, oil system that's been proven. There's no uh, maybes or ifs. It works. You know, it's funny you said, it's, I wanted to laugh because you said that uh, my information, everybody, if, okay, I'm thinking about the magazines. Everybody's information was different than mine and mine was different from theirs. Mm -hmm. It's still that way. I don't know anybody who teaches what I teach and how I teach it. You know what I mean? Um, so, I mean, we're a very niched topic. It's all about breeding. It's all about, you know, creating strains, using actual breeding programs, that kind of thing. We don't spend a lot of time on how to raise them, you know, that kind of thing, or how to feed them. I, I do have a feeding program on there, but that's about it. I mean, we don't talk about the other kind of stuff. We're very niche. We talk about breeding and that's about almost it. So... You know, I beg to differ with you, Kenny. We do talk a bit about how to raise them because we talk, we talk about pen space. We talk about roosting, you know, you know, how high or how low the roost should be. You know, we, we've talked about incubators and um, chick care. So yeah. yeah. I, on but, the show, but not on the website. Yeah. The website is 90% breeding pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and and plus that's what we that's what we specialize in. Is True. Breeding. True. So uh, that we 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 do do the other stuff. I'm working on some nutrition stuff. Uh, Kenny's already got some nutri a nutrition page on there. 
uh, like Nancy was doing the uh, record keeping. Uh, yeah, I'm still working on that one. So we do cover other things, but I would say we're at least what guys 90 percent breeding as far as the websites. Concerned. Well, yeah, yeah, that's our niche. Maybe more. Yeah. Maybe but more. there are other things around breeding that are important to know for breeding as well. Okay, and we have that, and we mostly cover that in the shows. Yeah, like in the members roundtable and things like that. Um, so yeah, make sure. Like I said, I'd rather you join the Breeders Academy. We almost didn't do this because we did want everybody in the Breeders Academy. But I understand that not everybody's going to join the Breeders Academy. I think if you did, you'd be amazed, and I think you'd like it. But if you just want the shows, and that's available, and I just want to repeat what I was saying earlier: if you're already a Breeders Academy member, don't join the YouTube memberships. Okay, uh, everything that's on there is on the website. You're already getting that. Okay, and if you. I mean, if you think that one is better than the other, it's the website because the breed, the uh, YouTube membership, although there's a lot of videos there, it's limited. It is. It's not all there, but there's a lot there. I think we have right now about 60, maybe 50 or 60 videos on there right now. We're going to be adding it, adding to that weekly. Um, but uh, that's a, that's what's there. So it's available to you that way. Okay. Um the only other thing I want to talk about real quick before we get into this is this is something Nancy and I talked about the other day. And this is what this is going to do. We're calling it the, uh, the weekly announcements. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to come on. It's going to be very informal. Just come on, kind of let you guys know what's been going on the week prior and in the upcoming week, kind of let you know what's going on, uh, what we have planned. What's coming up with the podcast? What's coming up with the master's class videos? What's coming up with the um, the live show and the members roundtable? Uh, anything we have planned. And just have a little chat with whoever shows up and just kind of give you guys a little information. Nothing special, but that would kind of alleviate or relieve some of what we're doing now. I mean, look at we're already over 30 minutes into the show. We haven't even gotten into the show. And the idea is to do that monthly um, announcements to maybe make it easier to get right into the topic on the live show. That's what we're hoping for. Actually, and Kenny, it's a weekly what announcement. I, you said monthly, and it's going to be on Mondays. Hopefully, it, things can change, okay? <laughs> but I'm planning on Mondays. Um, maybe I'll get into a routine. It'll be the same time of day on Monday, but, uh, we'll see. I may, I, I may just sit, go out there outside, sit at the picnic table with my computer, turn it on and then do it. That's kind of what I'm thinking. But that'll know? be for everybody. Yeah. It, yes. Yeah. Public. Yeah. 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 And I, I ran a test the other night. It was late too. I didn't think I was going to get anybody, but I did. And uh, ran some systems, checked out my wireless mic, make sure everything was working. Um, yeah. So that's what we're going to do and see how that goes. If it goes well and it accomplishes something, and I'll keep it going. But it's going to be very informal, just to kind of get some information out, maybe take a few questions. We'll see. But uh, that's what we're planning. Okay. So you guys ready to get into the topic? Finally? Yeah. What is the topic of the day, my dear? Topic is, we have a, well, okay. Proper storm care, preparing your birds for the incoming storm. Kind of goes what we're talking about and what's kind of going on. And uh, I'm glad Fra uh, Frank was, then he made it because this is kind of up his alley. <laughs> okay, Probably more so than me, but uh, maybe we can give some information that you that can help you guys. So, if, uh, if I was ever an expert, this would be my field. <laughs> okay so um get your guys' questions in this is a very this should be a very interactive um conversation your guys's input would make a big difference here and uh your input would be good because uh yeah it, it's gonna we'll cover a little bit of, about breeding but it's mostly about uh and it's not really winter care it's more like storm care what to do about a storm that you didn't really expect, but maybe you can prepare for, or maybe some things you can do about something, some things you can do to alleviate 
some of the pain that you're going through as you're going through it. Okay. So this first one would be uh, make sure your structures are secure, Frank. I see that here too. <laughs> yeah. What's so funny? Uh, well, because if anybody needs to make sure his structures are, are, you know, secure, it'd be Frank because he, he gets those like flash flood stuff where things just float away. <laughs> now, <laughs> like as, far, <laughs> as, as, as far as winds, I'm not affected as much by winds. We could have all the wind that we wanted, 30, 40 mile an hour winds. And I've done this so long that there's certain things that I do, but the location that I've got them is but Kenny's been there. He's seen it uh, here in Kentucky. We call them hollers. Uh, somebody else might call them valleys, but I've got hillsides on both sides. And I'd say it's a span of maybe a thousand yards from hilltop to hilltop. And I'm like halfway in it. So the, those mountains actually protect me from the wind. Now, the other day when we had all that wind and I send Kenny a video of it and, uh, it, it was pretty bad. It was blowing people off their feet. Wow. I didn't, I didn't lose a top, nothing. Uh, I've got my tops basically. And, and I got this from NASCAR, believe it or not. The roof flaps on top of the cars. Yeah. I secure the back two corners with um, zip ties. And I lay a small two pound weight on the front of it. Now, if the wind goes underneath it and gets ready to pick the cage up, the top goes back and it allows the air go through the top of the cage. Now, a lot of people says, well, your chickens get wet. I said, I'd rather have a wet chicken than a dead or, you know, blown off chicken. Uh, yeah. None of those tops. I've had them deploy before, flip back over the years. But uh, as bad as that wind was th this week, I didn't have one top that was even lifted up to flip back. N nothing was. Now, I've got the sides on it. And I've got all my cages positioned to where I know which direction the wind comes in. So it blocks it off the chickens, but the top, I do have it fixed to where if the wind gets underneath it to lift the cage up, the top comes back, lets the air through, and it doesn't actually take your cage off. I had a buddy that lost two cages, and I'm serious. They never found the chickens. They never found the cages. He don't know what happened to them. They just <laughs> flew off. And to this day, that was five years ago, wow. to this day, he knows of nothing of where they went or where they ended up at. That, who wow. knows? It could have been miles away. You never know. No way. Really? Uh, yep. Never to return. Never seen it. And these were, these were, were made out of a uh, two by six treated bottoms with the big 14 gauge wire with the dome 10 tops and two of them just gone. Chicken, chickens, pins and all just gone overnight, disappeared. Wow. Did you ever figure out what you're going to do about the feeders and waters? So they don't get uh, away? Just uh, take them up and not put them. If it's given bad weather, we just take them up and put, put them in the, the, uh, the building. Because uh, I was telling Kenny, Kenny was like, I said, I got some new feed cups, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to put them on until after the storm. Kenny said, well, just wire them on the pin. And I said, well, if you wire, if you secure anything on a pin, uh, the water comes up. If we have a flash flood, it comes off the mountain and it can be six inches deep. It can be a foot deep. And I mean, yeah. it's got some, it's got some pull to it. So just a, just a little bitty four ounce, four or five ounce cup, wire it onto your pin. If that water catches it, it's gone. Yeah, it's going to take the whole pin away, right? It'll take the whole pin. Those big metal pans that you and Kenny feed your birds out of. Yeah. If I had those in my pen and say the water hit it and went up against the pen, the pen chickens and all is going to be washed off. Wow. So when it's given bad weather that way, if I don't want to lose my, my cups, I just take them all, stack them up, put them inside the building. And, you know, after the, the weather's gone, then put them all back out again. Cause we've got to empty them anyway. Once it rains, you know, they fill up mm -hmm. full of water. So we have to, Amanda hates that too. That's, that's her, that's her pet peeve. She hates it when it rains cause she's got to dump all the water out of the, the cups. But, uh, yeah, it's, like, it's it's either the bad weather or the squirrels. The squirrels love them itself. They'll take them up in the trees and put them in their nest. Wow. But you know, the, guys, the weather's much worse. When I was in Kentucky, I saw all your houses down, what do you call it? The hollows? Mm -hmm. Is that what you call it? Okay. Holler. Down in the bottom. The hollers? Okay. Hollers. Okay. Hollers, all yeah. at the bottom. Now, in California, we'd be putting our, hells, our houses on top of the hill. Okay, and you said you guys can't do that because of the wind. We get high winds too, but maybe not as bad as you. I'm not sure. But we do. We put our houses on top of the hills. Because we like the view. 
Well, yeah, but <laughs> wait, wait till you hear what they do, Nancy, because I was just shocked. You know, you hear about all these floods in Kentucky. It makes so much sense because you got these hills on both sides and they all funnel down into this, this little area where the roads are and where the houses are. Okay. So all that rain's collecting on the hills and just running down to there. That's where all the flooding must be coming from. You know, we, we don't have that here. The only time we have flooding or, or any bad, anything bad is when we had a fire the year before, maybe even a couple years before all the vegetation's off the hill so that now it floods. And then the, the runoff from the hills, because there's nothing holding the hills up there anymore, then you have, what, mudslides and things like that. That's the big thing here. Well, so, what hurt us was the strip mining. That's what made it dangerous for us. Oh, is that the, right? The top of the hills, they took off. They flattened them. Made it like an mm-hmm. airport. You know, then, then there's no trees. Uh, only thing there is, if you're lucky, is a little grass when they, they, they re-sow it, reclaim it when they move back out of it. So when they done that, we lost, oh gosh, we had a natural disaster here back about uh, 10, 11 years ago. There was people, 30 some people killed, uh, just flash flood, come off one of the mountains. And it had never flooded there before, but we got such a, a hard rain and the, grain, the ground was already saturated, filled up full of water. So the water couldn't sink into the dirt. So it just, you know, just like a dam, a reservoir had ruptured and coming down so uh there was people uh one couple was inside the garage in their bass boat and the bass boat was all the way to the ceiling it was so full of water and it's the only wow. thing that saved them if, if they hadn't got in that boat and it was still on the trailer if they hadn't got in that boat they lost their lives too according well, to joseph we need to stop talking about this i think we're creating bad karma no, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that they call them haulers because if you didn't speak softly, all of the neighbors would be able to hear clearly oh, your conversation. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. Over there. yeah. I can't read it. Yeah, because when you're in the bottom of those and like uh, I'm up where my chickens is at and somebody is down in the roadway and they get out to go in somebody, I can hear every word they say. Every word. It just like it magnifies it, I guess. Wow. Well, that's funny because where my dad is, we have 40 acres. I grew up there, right? And um, there's really not very many houses around us. But my mom could walk out the house and we could be, at, you know, a couple, two or 3,000 feet away from the house down the hill. And my mom would just go, Kenny, Vinny, Glenn, Annette, come and eat. And she wouldn't even hardly yell and we could hear her just like she was standing right next to us. That's the way it, that's the way it is up there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my brother, you know, lives across the, the, the road there and I can be up there feeding the chickens and we can hear him talk inside his house. Oh my you know, gosh. And, and not have a door or anything. And we, you know, we can hear him sitting over playing his guitar, the television, everything. It just carries, it just magnifies it. I'm telling you, you can't have any Italians living over there in them hollers. <laughs> You'll get no peace and quiet. Because oh, yeah. those Italians, yeah, right. okay, no, I, <laughs> I'm sorry if I'm offending all the Italians. I love Italians. I married one. Um, a man who loves you. <laughs> I, I'm talking. I'm talking about Italian, aka Kenny. You know, <laughs> you know he, how they handle that here, Nancy. He talks a lot. <laughs> you know how they handle that here. Somebody's making too much noise uh, when they shouldn't be in the middle of the night. They walk out on their porch. They take their gun and go bah, 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 and go back in the house, and then it gets quiet. They do oh that here too. Gosh. That's how they do it. That's how they do it. We had a neighbor, the Roystons, Nancy. How would you, how far? Maybe a quarter mile away or mm, something like that. Okay. Not even that far. Not, maybe not that far. And I was out on my motorcycle at night, ripping up the hill, right? And he came out and shot a shotgun at me. I could hear the bullet, the the BBs or whatever you want, the shot going through the brush. And I went, oh crap! So I uh, stopped, and my dad was going to call the police, right? So he called them up. Hey, what the hell are you doing? He goes, I just shot the gun just to get them quiet. And he goes, it worked. <laughs> <laughs> it you does. Know, yeah. So I, I was like, crap, he's shooting at me, man. So. Just, oh, my gosh. Hey. Well, getting back to the winds, um, I don't yeah. know if if you have a special place to talk about the winds, Kenny, or are we talking ahead, about. Talk about it. I don't okay. care. Okay. So. Here in Southern California, we get what we call Santa Ana winds, and they're usually in October, November, December. Sometimes they can go all the way into like April of the next year. And those winds come from the desert. It's, you know, a high level 
I don't know what you call it, but in, in the four corners of the United States, when they get a, a, a high there in their weather, we get all the winds coming from the east and from, you know, the east of us are the deserts. And it can be anywhere from 20 to 50 mile an hour winds gusting or constant coming through Ramona. By the time you hit San Diego City proper, it's not as bad. But up here in Ramona, it really gets flying. And uh, yeah. Kenny has to wire down the tops of his round pens that he holds his up and coming, you know, stags and possible pens. Yeah, they're temporary pins and they're called, he calls them his round pins. And every time the wind gets a kick in like that, he's looking out the sliding glass door and making sure that none of those tops come off. And sometimes they do. I either put, I either tie them down or I put big bricks on them, which works too. You know, uh, biggest thing for the round pins is uh, uh, when it rains is um, cause they like to dig and create like a, a uh, shallow area inside that pen and then it collects the water. So then I got to move the birds out, put them in a different pen, fill it up with dirt, level it out, put the bird in there, you know, so mud, you know, water collecting and mud is a big problem. I use the, uh, mostly mine's dome pen. So I've got the, the colored tin wrapped on top. So it's mounted to the two to sixes, treated two to sixes at the bottom. I don't have a problem with that, but, uh, I lived in a, a flat area uh, back uh, probably 30 years ago. It was it was all completely flat as far as you could see. There wasn't a, a hill around really. It was out in the open. And what I done was I took chains and stakes. Uh, I call them dog couplings, like a, on the end of a dog chain, you know, mm -hmm. a leash. And uh, I took stakes and just uh, welded a washer up on top of them. And I took and uh, a piece of chain probably about six inches long and i put a dog coupling on each end of it and that way i'd just snap them on each side of that pin and i never had another pin flip over now we got it so bad that it would bend the wire a little bit where it was trying to pick it up a little bit but after that i didn't if you move your pins a lot it kind of, it's kind of aggravating it but it will save you a lot of grief on high winds uh, i would do it in the uh the uh march especially march and april because like nancy was talking about high winds march and april here uh, on the East Coast, it's terrible as far as the wind. It's pretty much every day. Well, not only do I either tie the tops down and put bricks on them, but I don't know if you noticed it when I was here. When you're here, is I use uh, what do they call them? Um, they're um, they're still rods. There's a rebarb. Rebarb. Yeah, they're about four feet long, and I'll drive those into the ground you know, a good couple feet into the ground and then tie the round pens to those. Mm -hmm. So I usually have three. I have uh, scattered all the way around the round pens, each of them. So that keeps the round pens from going anywhere. They're not going to go anywhere. And if they dig to where there's a little bit of a gap, whatever, I just take my little mallet hammer, pound them in. It brings the pen right down square to the ground again. And then I throw dirt in there to level it out. And then I put the chickens back in. You know, I, I used to have the round pins, uh, but I had to put uh, the smaller, you know, I had the uh, 14 gauge square welded wire, what my pins are made out of, but they would always run their heads through it and their hackles would be, look hideous. I would have to take, uh, you know, smaller check wire and put around it uh, probably two foot up to keep from them running their heads through it. But I used to have a ton of those, but with the dome pins, uh, I've had better luck out of those. I think I've got, when I built those with the tin, wood, all the materials, I was out probably about 43 bucks. Now they're probably double that. It'd probably take double that to, to fix them now. Probably yeah. more likely. Yeah. Um, chickens can handle a lot of cold. It's the drafts that kind of mess them up, you know, and if they get wet, if you can keep them dry and try to keep the drafts on, off them as much as possible, especially when it's windy, they can handle a lot of cold. So I don't usually look at the cold as being a big deal, especially well, California. It, you know, it's, it's funny, Nancy, we, everybody says we live in paradise, but we can have extreme weathers where we're at too. It can be hey, pretty darn cold. It can be pretty darn hot here. So we had a hurricane last year. Oh my God. Oh, that's right. I Tropical forgot about storm. that. 
<laughs> I forgot about that. It, it was crazy. <laughs> yeah, the, the rain was going this way instead of this way. And it did get windy for a little bit. But it was nothing like what the news was saying it was going to be. And it was nothing compared to what they get in Florida or the Southwest, the South uh, East, you know, I'm not even saying that right. You know, Louisiana and Texas and Georgia and all those places or, or the Carolinas per se. I mean, let's do all nothing like that. Let's just label them all off. Nits. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you, you got to give them credit because those guys go through hell when they get a hurricane coming in through that area. I mean, my heart goes out to them. It really does. You know, you know uh, go ahead, Frank. Go, uh, you know, I was just going to say that one of the things I do, not only do I prepare the pen the best I can and try to keep them as dry as I can, is um, I try to change their feed to accommodate the, the cold weather to keep them warm that way, too. Yeah. Yeah, that that that's a that's a big part. I mean, that that's a bit, and, and I do the same thing. If I know something's coming in, I try to accommodate the feed to where uh, it can help them, and I'll feed them late as I can at night, uh, where they you know they're nice and full and they're comfy. And but you know, in all the years I've had chickens, I, I'm 54 years old. And I've had chickens. I don't remember ever picking my first one up. That's how long I've had them. But I've never to this day, knock on wood. And people on the East Coast, they know pretty much around Kentucky, you know, we'll get down 30 below odd degrees. I mean, you walk out and your eyes and your nose instantly freeze. Oh. Uh, you go out, you take hot water, you throw it up in the air, it disappears, it's gone. It's that cold. And to this day, I've never had lost a bird to cold. Now, I've lost them to wind, okay, and flash flooding, but I've never lost one to cold, ever. And I, I see so many people uh, say they lose birds to cold and, I, uh, you know, feet, frostbite. Now, I do occasionally in those 30 blows, I have had the big straight comb birds lose their top, uh, the little tips on their comb. I have had that happen. But uh, I try to put, if, if we have a big cold front coming in, I try to adjust it. I'll go out and I'll buy that black plastic and wrap the pins. I try to, I take everything off the, the barrels and the cord area. Uh, you, you really got to work with it. If you work with it and do it to the best of your ability, a lot of times you're not going to have any issues. It's when something hits and you don't prepare for it. It's when you really have the, the problems. I don't think I've ever lost birds to the cold. I haven't heard of too many people that have myself. What I hear all the time and what I try to be careful of is like, we, like we said, we adjust the feed for the cold is that they lose weight. Exactly. Because when they lose that much weight, they usually never get it back. So it's really important to make sure their weight's good. Now, some people will say they try to drop the weight during the molt before the winter. I don't know. For me, that's a terrible idea because I think you're really going to go downhill after that. Because I try, especially when they start going into the molt, not only do I up the protein, but um, I try to do things that get them to gain weight. So that not only are they getting through the molt really well, but they're going into the winter really well with some weight on them because they're going to lose some of that through the winter. It does get, it still does get cold here. You know, I don't care if we live in paradise or not. It does get cold. And then whatever weight is left over, because I check them all the time going into the bring season, then I maybe do a little bit of adjustment there and I'm usually good. And they're right where I need them come spring. I do the same thing. I'll keep about a quarter ounce of gut fat on my birds through the colder parts of the year. Now, a lot of people said, oh, a quarter quarter of an ounce of gut fat. That's that's way too fat. I promise you, in cold weather, that that's a, a, a love part to the the, the birds, uh, that little extra of fat to help keep them warm. Uh, and they will pick up, like Kenny said, they will pick up an appetite during that cold weather. But what we have problems here, I mentioned the 30 below. If we have... That kind of temperatures, say six or seven days in a row, you can't, you water your birds. And as soon as you put the water in the pan, it's, it's froze up as soon as they take a couple of drinks. So that's where you've got to, uh, you know, I made a couple of videos using the electrolytes, uh, Gatorade and so forth, you know, trying to, trying to get the moisture back in them. So we, we have to do the best we can. I've, I've many times I've watered them with straight Gatorade. Uh, they like the great, the best by the way but uh you know it gets electrites gives them a little sugar helps get them over it but that, that's the biggest problem cold weather we have here is just keeping moisture in the bird it, itself and if they lack moisture they don't want to eat because 
you know, uh, we, we know when we're dehydrated and thirsty, that's the last thing we want is to eat. And the birds are the same way. They won't eat if they're, they're really bad dehydrated. You know, a lot of people look at the mud as an issue, but I don't sometimes want, think that they look at the mud as being the right issue or, uh, at, go ahead, Nancy. <laughs> Because you're you're moving on, but I you guys were so vague about how you change their feed right before turn a storm turn or turn off your when, light. Turn off your light. Okay. <laughs> right before you're gonna I mean, yeah, I'm like, okay, I'm pressing it. Uh <laughs> it's turn it off. It, turn turn it, it off. Turn, yeah. Should it go off? No. You broke it, Nancy. Yeah. Should yeah, it go off, off now? Yeah, it's off now. Okay. All right. So you guys were so vague about um, what you feed them when it gets super cold or, you, you know, just, winter and stuff. So what is it? Do you, do you um, use less pellet and more carbohydrates? I mean, explain. You the protein. Say it again. Say it again. You up the protein. Okay. You up the protein is what you do. If you're feeding uh, 18, take them up to 20, 21, you know, just give them a little bit of extra protein d during that you time. you talking about summer or winter? Winter, they're in the cold spells. You up the protein? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. What about the, the carbohydrates, though, keep them warm? Uh, mine gets carbohydrates year-round. Well, yeah, no, I know that, but um, I have heard that when it's really cold outside, you know, say you're going to have a below- uh, freezing temperature for the next two or three days. Wouldn't it be best to up their carbohydrates for um, for night? You know, right before they go to bed at night to keep them warm during the night. Carbohydrates fuel the muscles. That's fuel for the the muscles itself. Uh, what a lot of people says, oh, feed them whole corn. That will warm them up. That's not. There's never been no no survey that ever said that was was true now with me i want more of a protein feel more fat last longer in the in, in their system during the cold weather because without fat and cold weather you're dead you're not going to get that out of carbohydrates uh carbohydrates is good gives them energy and uh uh, makes them feel really good and and it makes them contain a lot of energy and you feed a lot of high, uh carbohydrates you take a okay Give you an example. I give my birds once uh, a really uh, high protein of feed by mistake. I didn't mean that, but I went over a little bit on my my mix. Okay, okay. I couldn't walk by the cage, Nancy. Uh, they would just start. They'd grab hold of the wire and try to hit me, and my birds don't do that. And I'm thinking, what in the world's going on here? You know what what what's the deal? And then uh, I noticed they started drinking a lot of water. They were drinking water like it was crazy. So I said, oh, I messed up. So I tossed that feed off, redone it, got the proteins back down on it, and everything went back to normal again. Because now it will, will amp on plunk. You feed the carb carbohydrates to give them energy to make them more vigorous during cold weather. It will help with that. But as far as keeping them warm and alive, you want to up, up, up the protein to build more fat and energy. That's what you want. Okay, so then let me ask you this. So during the winter months, you don't necessarily concentrate on whether your chickens are getting too fat or not because they need that extra fat to get through the winter. And then once the winter is gone and you're in the spring, you look at them, okay, they're a little bit chunky, and you adjust the feet again to uh, slim them down a bit. That's it. Right? That's it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you have For here, I go by the months, what I do. I go by the by the by the seasons, and if you don't uh, say if you've got a bird that's down thin like you, you'd have them in the summertime, here in the wintertime, uh, you better have him in a nice warm coop. Cause like Kenny Mitchell while ago with the drafts and everything, uh, I've never had a bird freeze to death. But if you've got them in the flesh that they are in the summertime with this uh, 25, 30 below, they're not going to make it out on their own. Uh, we don't use heaters, but you better have a fire or heater up for that boy. He's not going to make it low. Okay. And then I got one more question. How can you tell when your bird is dehydrated? What are the signs? The same thing. If you pick a bird up and he's thin, uh, a sick bird, that's what he's going to feel like. He's going to lose all of his mass, his, his, his muscle mass. Uh, he's pretty much just going to be a skinny mini pretty much. Let me uh, tell you what happened real quick. A friend of mine, 
he um he started he he didn't the what okay the bird was kicking dirt in the water so he thought he'd put the water up near the roost so the bird had to jump up to the roost to get the water and then i don't know how much time elapsed before he came to me he says oh my birds are all getting really thin right and so i looked it over and this is early, early when i was younger and i looked over i couldn't figure out what the heck they're all getting thinner so this is around the same time i met tony too and i went and told told tony in it about it he goes well is the water easy to get to i says yeah he goes where is it and i said it's up on the roost every time he goes up there he can get, uh, easily get to it he goes he's never going to drink it mm -hmm. and so the guy put the water back down and they did get better after that but they lost so much weight they never really got their full breast muscle back you know so he kind of ruined them and i and that never left me that you need to make sure the waters are in front of them all the time. If they have to work to find it and to drink it, a lot of times they don't. Or they're just, uh, they're, they're not smart enough to realize how to get to it. I've yeah. seen that a lot. See, I, on some of those, um, uh, dome cages we was talking about, I put uh, jump boards up on them to keep outside chickens from drinking out of the water bowls and the feed cups. And I thought it was an ingenious ideal. Uh, you know, it keeps down disease, all that good stuff. You know, only the chickens in the pen is drinking out of the water bowls and cups. Well, I got some out and just like Kenny said, they was just like I'd starve them to death. And uh, until I put those jump boards in there, they, they was pull, I mean, perfectly fine breasts, you know, uh, the weight they need to be. And some of them was fine. Some of them was completely awful. And it was like Kenny was saying, some of them just wasn't smart enough or didn't want to take the extra energy to jump up on that jump board to drink the water or to be able to find it. And they, it was just like a bird that's dehydrated is the same as if you starved that bird. They feel the same. Don't they Kenny? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then here's my next question. You know, if you've got birds that are constantly kicking dirt into their waters, what do you suggest to keep in keeping the waters cleaner? Well, I can tell you what I do is I have these crates I put in there and I put the waters on top of that. I mean, they still will see that and they like jumping up there anyway, so they can see better. Um, but it, the water's just got to be where they can find it easily. If they have to hunt for it, search for it or work to get to it, a lot of times they're either too stupid to do it or they don't. I don't know. But yeah, it, you got to find ways to keep the water clean, but in, in front of them all the time. I always use something my water is never on the ground ever i don't set it right on the ground if i've got it in the pen i've always got like a block or some kind of pedestal I lift it up off the ground a cup i've even got these things and it's actually made for it they're plastic it's like a little dome it's up probably about that tall you set your water in the middle of it and the chicken steps up on it to drink that way they're, they're not scratching dirt in it. It's up off the ground. When they scratch dirt, the dirt's missing it where it's up off the ground. But it's a, it's not that big a deal. They just got to step up, you know, two or three inches to be able to get it. They can actually reach it from the ground, but they can still step up and, and drink it. As long as it's not right down on the ground, you're not going to have that big a problem with it. But I want to go back just one other thing with a chicken. Uh, a chicken's not like a human in the fact to where we can suck water through a straw. Okay, we can put our lips against water in a creek and, and pull the water up through our mouth. Well, chicken's not like that. They don't have the, the muscles in the jaws like we have to be able to do that. They take a bill of water and it's gravity fed. They raise their head up. The water runs down the neck. Each drink, they're using gravity for that water to run down. I've seen people put it on the outside of their cage, sort of like what Kenny was talking about, like on the roost pole. And the chicken could run his hell out and get the drink of water, but he couldn't lift his head up oh, to let yeah. the water run down. So even though if you got the water on the outside of the cage, it doesn't mean that he's going to be able to get it down his neck because by the time he gets meshing around, the water's come back out of his neck. So they need to be able to get the water and pull the head up to let the water go down the neck. So I found out a lot of problems with people laying chickens, uh, had the water up off the ground that way, was complaining about, like Kenny said, with the guy birds feeling skinny and dehydrated. And that, that was the reason for that. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. I mean, good to know. I mean, there's so much that we just take for granted, you know, yes. that, you know, you've got the water there, they'll figure out how to get to it, but you're right. 
they they do they they put some in their mouth and and then it goes down the neck that way i mean yeah okay it's not like us sorry kenny went off on a little questionnaire thing i'm going to charge you for the 15 minutes we lost so <laughs> <laughs> um, no actually i'm sorry members because it's going to take you 15 minutes longer to get to the back and the it's all her fault and it's okay. all my fault <laughs> But we have been an hour and five minutes. We could and close out the show now. Too, you know, so, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Mud. Let's talk about mud for a second. Okay. A lot of people think it's just a pain in the butt, gets the birds dirty, gets you dirty. But, man, it, it causes disease because that mud's mixed in with manure, too, Frank. Yeah. Well, you look at it this way, Kenny. How, all the years that you've had your birds on your farm, all the years I've had my birds on my farm, Okay. That's the reason I lime it every year, because if you're not liming it and taking care of the pH in your ground, that mud is not mud. It's chicken manure. Because if you've had chickens there for 30 years and you're not liming it and tilling it and doing what you're supposed to, a good six to eight inches of that topsoil is nothing but manure and bacteria, coccidiosis on demand with a little heat added to it. So you're, you're right. Uh, it's, it's the most dangerous thing next to diseases that we can have. And that's the, a lot of times the biggest part of diseases is, is just that or chickens eating that stuff. Yeah. You know, um, I'm now starting to have chicks hatch and usually this time of year, it's uh, pretty nice. We're usually done with the rain. It's not wet. And um, God, it pissed me off. You know, it's like we got birds on the ground. I've got birds sitting in nests, birds getting ready to, to start setting. And this rain comes, just messes things up. And I had a couple pens where the ground got all wet and little, maybe a little mud, but the damn hen tracked it into her nest box and got all her eggs in it. And she was almost ready to start setting on them. And I'm trying to figure out what do I need to do because I don't usually have this. This doesn't usually happen to me. <laughs> you know what Lucky I mean? Like, what? Lucky yeah. you. All Lucky right. So, so what did yeah. you do? It don't happen to you that often. Oh, That's yeah, a common yeah, occurrence yeah. with me. Right. No, no, yeah. no. But it's happening to me now. And I've got a couple of hands where do I just pull those, those eggs out and she start all over or something? I'm like, damn. I was pissed. Well, okay. <laughs> so you're pissed. What did you do? I haven't done anything yet. I'm trying to figure out what I want to do about it. This, this is what I do, Kenny. This is okay. what I do. And th th this happens to me every time it rains, just about it. You know, that's the reason... I'd rather do hen hatches in better weather, not yeah. in the winter time. Uh, but uh, you can buy a egg wash that doesn't remove the bloom from your egg. And the bloom is uh, the, the uh, film that the hen leaves on the egg to protect it. Now, if you wash that, say, with dishwashing liquid, that egg will not last near as long as it would have with that bloom on there. Uh, so uh, you can get a wash uh, from a lot of your... Uh, feed stores, tra uh, tractor supplies that, that will not remove that bloom, but it will, will do it. And I just put them in there, leave them for a minute or so, and just kind of give them a light wipe, wipe and put them back in. And I've had good success out of that, but uh, uh, Kenny's right. If they get all nasty and mud all over them, you're not going to, you're not going to have the hatch that you need because by that time we told you what most of the mud is. It's just, uh, it's just bacteria on top of bacteria. And that's not good with chicks could end up being an exploding eggs, you know, that kind of thing. Very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah well, I was gonna, Cause the last couple of winters we've had, were kind of late actually. And I, I didn't think we had exactly a late winter, although we had a storm that came through now. Okay. And those late winters have pushed my breeding season over a couple months. So I'm not having the, I usually start hatching, Oh, uh, they start collecting the eggs in January. They're usually on the eggs by February. And then I usually stop around late May, early June. Well, we're in April right now. And I'm going to have a handful of hens or a good number of hens that probably, will, probably won't be setting on their eggs till late April, early May. That's not, I don't like, that's not good to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't like doing that. Well, I'm in the same boat with you. You've yeah. seen the weather we've had. And usually I, well, I, I take that back. I've got some that's probably four and a half months old right now, uh, free ranging. But usually I've got all mine done. As far as I've, this is my third clutch yesterday. 
that we had ha- hatched off. And I've got, just like Kenny said, I've got probably about uh, 10 hens getting ready to come off in the next week or so, week, week and a half. So this weather's put me way back behind uh, as well. Well, here's the thing, Kenny. I hope to God they're not going to be hatching the weekend that you're gone. <laughs> You know, I didn't think about Please that. Please do enough. not do that to me. They should be. Um, I'm should hoping be. that. No, they shouldn't should, be. That's the word. Shouldn't. No, they shouldn't be. That's we're we're not leaving until late May. Yeah. yeah. Actually, you're you're not coming back until uh first of June. I'm not coming back till she's raised all my chicks and they're all good without me, you know. <laughs> Fine, I'll quit my I'll job and I'll just do all that. My work, you know. <laughs> I'm gonna call before I get on the airplane and go, hey, so how are my chickens looking, Don Nancy? I'm oh, gonna okay, say well, uh, they all know. flew the coop. <laughs> what chickens? <laughs> yeah, what chickens? Yeah, what chickens? <laughs> it's just me here and the cat. <laughs> you know, okay. So, uh, okay, diseases. Okay, this is a big one because the common thought is: here comes a storm. Get out the antibiotics. Let's start pumping them full of medications, antibiotics. Let's load them up because we want to prevent. A disease, which it doesn't prevent a disease, um, but uh, I don't know. What just, do you think, Frank? Just, just pre- I don't think it. No, you're right, Kenny. The only thing it does is prevent the symptoms. Uh, it's one of those deals, out of sight, out of mind. I guess you could say, as long as they're not showing the symptoms, they're healthy, regardless of them being sick. You know, I just thank God. I really do. I I thank God that I wised up and I got away from all the medications and and what have you. But I look at it this way. If I hadn't, where they took them all off the market, well, you can still get the, you know, the black market type uh, antibiotics and, and drugs for chickens. But just think what a bind that would put people in that was so used to using these medications and then they take them all off the market. And then you got to buy them, you know, from Mexico, the Philippines, places like that to get them in. And that's so much money. And it's just, you're burning money. You're getting rid of it. That's another thing I said uh just becoming a, a breeders academy member it's it's going to save you money that allows you to get rid of those meds what you save in money you're going to have money left over with being a member of the breeders academy and come out with more money and still be a member that way so uh, i think it's a it's a win-win I, I thank god that i don't have to use drugs on my chickens antibiotics well when i look at farms that think they need the medications just to keep their birds alive just because a storm is coming that's a pretty weak farm and I look at disease as a selection point and I breed for resistance to disease. So anytime I get a sick bird, which I haven't in a long time, but I'll call it, I'll call it to me. It's a weak bird. I don't plan on breeding it. Any bird that doesn't, isn't going to be used for breeding on my farm doesn't have a place on my farm. So, um, yeah, go ahead, Nancy. Um, okay. You guys talked about, muddy eggs and muddy pens because of the rains and stuff, but you didn't tell me what the solution was. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm backtracking a little bit because I want to know how are you going to fix feathers that are all full of mud and gunk? You fresh know? litter. So what is your fresh letter that litter though? I mean, what is your material that you, you like use? Hey, don't keep- you Frank? Yeah. Well, and, and the reason if I had my pick, I'd use corn shucks. That's the best thing ever. They last so long. You can get them out of a pen. I used to have an old uh, an old dryer that had the heat nail. I took the heat element out of it and just used, you know, where it would go around. And I'd take those corn shucks, still had the corn, corn cob on them, the shucks and everything. And I'd buy them in big bales, just like straw. And I'd use them in my pens. And when they got a little bit dirty, I would just throw them in that, uh, that uh, old dryer and let them tumble to get all the dirt out of them. And then I take them and, you know, distribute them back into the, the, the pen again. But uh, the reason I use straw and alfalfa hay is, one, the chickens scratch through it. They get a lot of nutrients out of it, especially the alfalfa. They love it. And not only that, my yard, it fertilizes my yard. It keeps the yard good uh, to work uh, like a compost, so to speak, where they scratch it and it comes out of the pens eventually. It ends up all in the yard. And if you see some of my videos, it's just in the wintertime, it's covered. It's just a straw kelp uh, yard, fenced in area. And uh, you get some vegetation grows up out of that. The chickens keep down. But it, it where it's like a compost, it just keeps your soil, uh, the pH levels and everything in it really good. 
you know, Mark was talking about pepper trees and you whoop, slugged my mic. Um, you've seen my, my uh, place here, Frank. I have pepper trees all over the place. And I love, Nancy hates them. Okay. No, I, love them. I, 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 I like I the smell of them. I don't hate them. I don't, I, do. I don't necessarily hate them, Kenny. I just think you that you're allergic to them because you get really bad allergies. And I think it's because of the, the, the pepper trees. I don't know. I think it's the the bushes we plant in the back of the house, actually. Um, oh yeah, I forgot about those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been flowers I, over hey, ten years, and I warned you. No, I warned trees. you. Well, we'll see. Uh, yeah. I'll either get used to them or I'll die. Okay. So uh, the pepper trees are awesome <laughs> because every day, every year, I scoop up the leaves, all the debris from the trees that's on the bottom, on the ground. S scoop that up, put it in my pens. And he's right when it, like, even when I'm, you know, during the rain and it starts getting a little wet and muddy, I'll throw that in there. And, uh, it works out great. I love the pepper trees. They're yeah. great on my chickens. And I, and I keep trying to dig. I've talked to Peter Brown. I've talked to, talked to Dr. Gallardo, a uh, number of other people trying to figure out because I haven't wormed my birds in forever. I don't, I just don't warm my birds. I never have to. Okay. And any in the past, anytime I had a bird that 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 was that wormy, I I would call it. So I'm trying to figure out, and I think it may be a combination of both, that there's something about the environment that's given them some resistance to the worms, but I also think they're genetically resistant to the worms at this point too. It's the way I bred them. Uh, the guy I used to work with all the time, Doug, he was a geneticist and knew a lot about this. He was the first one to introduce that idea to me that if you could selectively breed them towards a resistance to parasites, being worms and lice and mites, that uh, they wouldn't, you wouldn't have the problem anymore. And so anytime I had birds with lice and mites and worms, that was bad enough to notice it, that I would get rid of it. And I still, to this day, I can't remember last time I've seen lice, mites, or worms to a point where, well, lice and mites for sure. But if they have worms on them, it's never been a problem. You know, they've never been infested with worms and they've always been healthy. So is it genetically, uh, genetic resistance or is it my freaking pepper trees? <laughs> I can't get an answer out of anybody on that. I think it's both. And I, 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 I told you that when I was out there, because you can break one of those pepper trees, just the, the stem off of it and smell of it. It's like oregano hit a knock your head back and see, yeah. I've always, I, I, I have fed oregano for the past 15 years and it's the same way. Uh, it helps you with any type internal parasites. And uh, a, a lot of people over the years, they said, they said, okay, when they took, uh, when the FDA took the, the antibiotics out of our meat, meat and eggs, chickens, okay, commercially, how do they raise those birds without antibiotics? And my answer was, and if you go to any, any type person that's in the industry, as far as uh, teachings, in any type of poultry, they will tell you oregano is the way to go every time. And a pepper tree and oregano is pretty much almost hand in hand as far as the properties that it has on internal parasites. And I, I, I told Kenny when I was out there, I said, I think that's the reason. Because I'm going to tell you, Kenny, and I, I don't know if I mentioned this that day out there or not. But if you think about it, when your birds go into moat, their immune system bottoms out. That's the weakest their immune system is at that time. If your birds had worms and they get stressed out, especially into the moat, you would know they had worms because those worms would take over the bodies of those birds when the immune system got down. Put that back up with Mark, Nancy. Okay. I got a question for him. I'm not doubting you because I don't know. Okay. But uh, if you could find any um, uh reports or any kind of information that confirms that that i can not only read but maybe share with my members on the website that would be awesome you know so if you have any anything that shows that how that's a works, fact that it's a fact and you know i'd love to see it now, so, I, don't, I don't know on pepper trees but i've not researched the pepper trees but i do know oregano does for a fact it's documented studied cases here in the last three years Frank, is there anything else you want to cover when it comes to preparing for the storms, dealing with the storms, you know, fixing them after the storms before we uh, get off? The, the, the biggest thing that I would advise them to do is I know it's difficult, but 
use two by sixes on your framing rather than four by fours. And even if you use four by four framings on your pins, lock them down. Uh, uh, like I was talking about a while ago, uh, Kenny, use the stakes to hold your pins down. Uh, if you don't use them all year long, use them in like the windiest times of the year because with the cold and all the predators and everything that we've got that goes against the chickens, the biz the biggest problem that I see with any backyard chicken people is wind and, and really bad storms, uh, blowing their pins over their chickens, getting out that sort of thing. But, uh, I know it's, it's a hassle, but if you stick them down, I think, uh, you're going to have a lot less headache by staking them down that, than it, the actual work itself. Yeah. Anything you want to say, Nancy, before we wrap it up? No, I am just looking forward to the lectures on literature on pepper trees that Mark says he has that, so that I can yeah. read up on it. That's going to be really interesting. So thank you very much, Mark. Also, we had one question from Rolando. Rolando, we are going to answer that. I've written it down. We're going to answer that inside the round table. So we, I didn't forget you, but we'll <laughs> answer that inside the round table. And he'll be there. And make sure that you like, subscribe, and share. Share often if you love our show and give us a thumbs up for uh, YouTubers. Okay. So appreciate you guys coming, joining us, listening, contributing. Got a lot of good comments. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. So for my members, make sure you meet us in the back end. We're going to do the members round roundtable next. And for everybody else, thanks for uh, joining us. See you guys later. Enjoy guys. the eclipse, guys. <laughs>